Hi, I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, Fantastic Four Grand Design, and Transformers vs. G.I. Joe. Last time we talked about issue zero, um, the free comic book day issue, the, the prelude chapter of Transformers vs. G.I. Joe. Today we're talking about Transformers vs. G.I. Joe issue one, the first issue of this comic that... Uh, People had to like dig into their pocket and actually pay for it. The free comic book day version, issue zero, uh, was a huge hit. Lots of copies out there. Lots of people snapped it up. Very favorably reviewed. Um, you know, lots of talk on social media and on the blogosphere. It was a hit. But it's one thing to have a hit comic that's free, and another thing altogether to have um, you know a hit comic. Um, that people have to actually pay for. We were wondering, okay, you know, uh, how's this one going to do? Now for the cover, this is the first time I ever did a cover like this, where there's sort of like a, you know, cast of thousands, lots of different characters. And um, that ended up being how a lot of the, the covers for uh, Transformers versus Joe were. And it's, it's just the, the uh, subject matter sort of dictated that it's it's um this comic with a huge ensemble cast um you know really two ensemble casts merged together so it's a lot of personnel and everybody has their favorite character and so um you know the covers tended to be a lot of stuff going on a lot of excitement but um you know a couple dominant figures Soundwave, snake eyes turning his back on on the the gi joe team and the whole war and and specifically General Flag. More about him later. He's got his pearl-handled revolver. You know, I used design elements from uh, issue one of of Transformers, where this would have been like a um, would have been the Optimus Prime figure on the cover. I think I think it was painted by Bill Sankevich. And then this element is kind of from uh, GI Joe number one, where they're sort of you know hoisting the flag. Transformers versus G.I. Joe fans, don't just stand there with your jaws hanging down. Salute your commander. Introducing the top Joe, General Lawrence J. Flagg. General Flagg was an off-screen presence in um, issue zero, you know, sort of mentioned. And, and, and he wrote the battlefield report at the, at the end of the, of the issue. But here's where you get to see him. He was another character that I sort of, you know, learned about from researching this series and, and reading a lot of old G.I. Joe comics. I, I knew the name flag from the USS flag, that giant um, aircraft carrier toy that came out in the 80s, probably the most expensive, you know, vehicle, uh, you know, that was ever, ever made for a toy, for a toy line, for the G.I. Joe toy line. I didn't know that there was an actual general flag character until I started reading the old comics. And then also, you know, re-watching a lot of the old cartoons, I saw there was a general flag in the cartoon, but he was very different. He was, um, there's, a, there's a character in, in this uh, called, uh, you know, General Iron Butt Austin. That's kind of what General Flag looked like in, uh, in the cartoon. And, and he was only in like one scene in, you know, maybe the first episode. And he was, you know, sort of like a middle-aged guy with a mustache and uh, desk jockey, a sort of blustering blowhard but then in the comic, there was General Flag, you know, who was the leader of the team, and there wasn't a toy for him. And he was, you know, part of those early, early issues. So Colonel Hawk was the leader of the team, and there, there was a toy of him. Uh, I think you had to buy the tank to get him. I don't think you could, like, buy him separately. He, he came with a vehicle, which is why, you know, he wasn't part of my collection and, and um, you know, not part of a lot of people's collections, uh, considering he was kind of the main guy for the first you know, 20 or so issues before Snake Eyes kind of became the Fonz and, and and took over the whole thing. In that iteration of General Flag, he was kind of like one of the characters from MASH. He was kind of, um, you know, kind of lighthearted and wasn't a huge presence in the comic, but um, I liked his shades. He had a nice pair of sunglasses. And so I kind of took that visual and I tilted his hat and made him into kind of like a, um, uh, you know, Marlon Brando in um, in the wild one. Gave him this like attitude and made him this like kind of, you know, super hard ass, uh, you know, guy who would like yell in your face and like super cool, you know, perfectly dressed, has has his hat at, the, at, that, at that angle. You know, sort of war movie 
tough guy to the 10th power, kind of like, you know, just, just pu- pushing that thing really far and, and, you know, having them kind of talk in, in a, you know, funny way. And yeah, he makes his premiere here. We got uh, Snake Eyes uh, chopping firewood. Uh, this time he's got his face covered up with a mask after his accident in issue zero. You know, he's got his sleeves rolled up and we see his Arashikagi tattoo. And he's uh, chopping wood and he has his, um, his, his pet wolf, Timber. General Flag says, you're supposed to yell timber when you chop down a tree. You know, a little, little reference to there's Timber uh, growling at General Flag. And Snake Eyes is out by, by, you know, living in his log cabin in the middle of nowhere. And that was, that was something from the Larry Hama comics. Uh, you know, Snake Eyes had this cabin out, out in the woods where, you know, he'd spend a lot of time, spend his R&R. So, you know, in this iteration, he's, this, this is where he is. And, and so, yeah, he chopped down a tree. It almost fell on, on uh, General Flag. And, you know, it's, it, we wonder uh, if that's intentional or not. You could have killed me. You're supposed to yell timber when you chop down a tree. Still not talking, huh? Still living on the coldest piece of American real estate you could find. Still brooding and boohooing alone in the darkness. The long winter is coming, Snake Eyes. Better smarten up. Sort of comes out there to try to, you know, coax uh, or taunt Snake Eyes back into joining the G.I. Joe team because there's trouble brewing. And this page, I, I drew it a bunch of times and like I, I was having a hard time getting it the way I wanted. And then I, I was out for a jog and I passed a tree and I thought, you know what, this is it. Like, like it, you know, it was this very like interesting looking tree stump with all these little knots and edges where before it was kind of, I had drawn sort of a more like a healthier cylindrical tree, but I, I really like this. I kept drawing it and drawing it and I, and I, um, you know, inked it, you know, like a fully inked version, but it still wasn't the way I wanted it. And then I, I, you know, put it on my light box, you know, put another piece of paper down and then, uh, traced my fully inked and rendered drawing, uh, in pencil just did it all purely in pencil and that's what I scanned in here and I I loved the look of it. I really, you know, felt like I I'd, I'd found like a new aesthetic for myself and that's that's more or less become the aesthetic that I've used on on every project ever since. Um now I I drew these I drew these pages out uh, out of sequence. So there's some pages that are still inked uh in a traditional way but but um you know, as much as I could, I, I, I tried to, you know, do the same sort of pencil technique. And, and, and that becomes, like I said, like the rest of the issues and, and the rest of my career, you know, are, are pretty much exclusively drawn that way. It's become like my, my stylistic trademark. And now we're back to, um, you know, two pages that are kind of, uh, you know, traditionally inked, which, which works out fine because it's a, it's a change of scene. And I, I tried to fit as much storytelling as I could into a panel or a page. And so you got a lot going on here. You have you know, this sort of, uh, you know, darkness and fire and gung-ho standing on a water tower with holding Tomax and Zaymot. And uh, in the background, a uh, cobra rattler is um, you know, shot down, about to crash into this billboard for Springfield, a nice little town, the, the little small town that Cobra, you know, had, had taken over and, and, and made it into their sort of base and, and testing ground. And so, you know, Springfield, you know, was very important in the original G.I. Joe series, and it's, it's very important in, in uh, this series, too. And you have sort of this, like, family in the photo, and... Uh, you know, one of the, you know, Crimson Guard guys in a civilian identity. I think um, in, in the regular G.I. Joe continuity uh, that Larry Hama wrote and then continued, you know, went from Marvel to IDW with, I think um, his son ends up becoming like the new Snake Eyes after the, the seeming death of the original Snake Eyes in in like the regular series. Really good comic. I recommend you check it out. So then that ship blows up and so... Um, you know, the, we get a better look at what's going on here. It's no longer like a sort of knockout, but now it's sort of full color and he lifts them into the air. Tomax, 50% owner of the Crimson Guard. Zamot, the one with the scar. And the way you remember he's the one with the scars because he has X at the beginning of his name for the, for the uh, sort of X on his face. And yeah, I mean, as a kid, I remember the commercials, you know, leaders of the Crimson Guard. 
so these guys, you know, stood out in my mind and, and, and the idea of, of them being twins. And I think, and in the cartoon, it, it was like the Corsican brothers. And it might've been that way in the comic too. Like if you hurt one, the other felt it and they finish each other's sentences and stuff. Here's a little move I learned from Roadblock. Gung ho, beware his spicy Cajun gumbo. And so, you know, he's like, oh, this is a, a move I, I learned from Roadblock. So I, I kind of, in this comic, I kind of have Gung Ho as sort of, has sort of like a hero worship thing. Roadblock was his hero and that he looked up to Roadblock, but he wasn't as strong as Roadblock. Uh, he wasn't as smart as Roadblock and he was, he, he fancied himself a cook, but he wasn't as good a cook as Roadblock. He, he, you know, would make a spicy gumbo that, that nobody liked. There's this whole battle playing out. This is some first mission they roped us into Beachhead. You should hear Duke's stories about his trial by fire. So this is their first mission, those two. Reference to Duke's first mission, which we saw in the previous issue. And now Duke is more of a leader. So he had his trial by fire and his initiation into the you know, elite forces of G.I. Joe. And now he's you know, something of a leader. So lots of little stuff going on in this, in this scene. You know? and, and the more you pay attention to it, the more you're rewarded. We have Stalker and Quick Kick, a couple of my favorites. It kind of takes place in almost sort of like, you know, Barbie houses, uh, you know, these sort of like, you know, doll houses, kind of this um, generic suburbia with, you know, swing sets and sliding boards and backyards. And it kind of, you know, reminds me of, you know, my childhood in the 80s, you know, and it's kind of, it's kind of the uh, sort of homeowner's dream of the 80s, 80s suburbia. And also there was the old G.I. Joe comics, um, you know, there'd be these interesting issues every now and then where there'd be some kind of battle or something like, uh, one that comes to mind is, is the one that has sort of like the dog fight, uh, between Ace and, and like his sort of Cobra equivalent where they have this dog fight over, you know, just like American suburbs, you know, just like there's people in their backyards having barbecues as, as there's this, uh, you know, dog fight, this aerial dog fight going on. And, and it was kind of interesting, uh, every now and then, like Hama would do these kind of like World War II style um, army comics, these, you know, World War II style war comics, except he would, you know, transplant it to 80s suburbia, 80s American suburbia. And so it was just like a really interesting, you know, it, it just was a very interesting thing seeing, you know, the kind of things you'd see in an old, you know, World War II documentary but, you know, you know, over like the New Jersey suburbs or something. And it, it was uh, kind of interesting. And, and, it, and so I wanted to do some of that in here, too. So that if these guys kick him in the shins and, and he drops them. And, and now they're, you know, pointing their guns at him. But then, um, you know, Wild Bill's tomahawk chopper pulls up to save the day. And, and uh, Quick Kick climbs up and, and he's got a throwing star ready. And, and uh, um, Stalker has climbed up. He's got his gun drawn. Uh, Rock and Roll has his you know, giant uh, guns from like one of the later issues with him and Roadblock's got his, you know, giant guns pointed. So, you know, they kind of save gung ho's bacon. You old timers don't got to babysit me. I had the situation under control. Siegfried, Roy, drop him or get dropped. There are two ways to get down. I suggest the helicopter ride. And so here's rock and roll. I kind of, you know, redesigned rock and roll. It gave him uh, long hair, a beard, and like a big, uh, big bandana. Like, you know, the, the idea of rock and roll, I guess, to like, you know, the creators of G.I. Joe, uh, Larry Hama and uh, Herb Trimpey. And I get like their idea of rock and roll was kind of like, um, I guess, the Beach Boys, because rock and roll kind of looked like, you know, Brian Wilson or, or like a combination of, of Brian Wilson, Dennis Wilson, Al Jardine and Mike Love, you know, all, all sort of rolled into one character. And, and just I mean, as much I love the Beach Boys, but uh you know, it just, it didn't feel like rock and roll. So I went for like more of, you know, sort of like a, a, a rock and roll look. And so here we have Destro watching the whole thing, uh, his little wrist missiles ready to go. I, I couldn't wait to use his wrist missiles in, in some manner. Like I just, I, I, I had the Destro figure. I thought he was a super cool figure. Um, I love those little wrist missiles he had. Really, um, th you know, thought he was, was a great character in the comics. Um, in, in, in a certain, in some ways I feel like, Destro and the Baroness are the main characters of the, the um, you know, Marvel G.I. Joe comics. And so he's in hiding and he's here with, uh, the, with Serpentress. Now, um, you know, w when I had originally 
uh, written this issue and, and envisioned it initially, um, I was going to have Cobra Commander and the Baroness in it um, prominently, but I killed Cobra Commander in issue zero. That that wasn't the initial plan, but in the making of that issue, um, that moment just sort of spontaneously emerged and made so much sense, and I had to do it. So it kind of threw a little bit of the advanced planning off, but you know it was simple enough. I, I and so then I also kind of had the decision. You know, I could, you know, have have Snake Eyes kill him and then, you know, bring him back in issue one. And I thought, you know what, I I think I do want to bring Cobra Commander back. But if you bring him back in issue one, it kind of immediately kills the impact uh, that his death has or his, his seeming death has in issue zero. So I thought, as much as I love Cobra Commander and I want to use him in this series, I'm going to have to let him rest for a while, keep him, keep him out of the you know, out of the book for a while, just, just to let that, you know, the feeling of that, uh, issue zero kind of linger. Destro, who I, I had, you know, envisioned being part of this, you know, anyway, but so Destro is there and Serpentress, which was sort of the closest thing. Um, I, I didn't invent too, too many original characters for this. I planned on creating more than I ended up making. I, you know, I'll have, I'll have to do some kind of inventory of all the original characters I came up with this, but Serpentress is a semi-original character. Um, like when she first shows up, you know, she seems as though she's a, you know, completely new character. She sort of, um, you know, obviously there was Serpentor, the, um, the Cobra Emperor, and so here's Serpentress, the Cobra Empress, Spoiler alert uh, to everybody, but you know later on she's revealed to be the Baroness, and I, I didn't go to any huge effort to conceal that reveal. I figured you know it, you know if, if you're paying attention, it, it it you know it's it's not too hard to to piece that, but but also you know still you know possibility that she could be somebody else altogether. But so that was that was a way of I wanted to use the Baroness, but. Uh, you know, she was seemingly dead as well. Her her seeming death was not as conclusive as Cobra Commander. She did not get a sword through her chest like he did. But you know, she she was in a, in a you know missing, presumed dead. You know, fr- from an airplane crash. We have the Arbco ta- Tower, which was you know a Cobra front company. There was there's Ma- Mars, which is uh, Destro's company, and then we have this um, dynamic signage going on. You know, telling you the story. The, of um, this approaching planet of Cybertron, this sort of strange celestial body that's coming close to Earth and that that they're getting transmissions from. So it's kind of like, you know, it's this dangerous collision course. They, they think of it as an asteroid and it's this, da- but it's really the planet Cybertron. And, um, you know, it's on a collision course with Earth. It's dangerous, but they're, they're also getting transmissions from it. So it's kind of this sort of proof of, of life on another planet. And the, um, the dynamic signage that's going, you know, on all these different buildings says, asteroid on collision course with Earth. Asteroid nicknamed Face of Darkness. There's Soft Master, uh, one of Snake Eyes masters, one of the guys who taught Snake Eyes everything he knows, uh, one of his three masters. Free informative booklet all about the planet entering our solar system. Not an asteroid, not an asteroid. One for the lovely lady and one for you, sir. Thanks. And a small donation, sir. I thought you said it was free. Free for the lovely lady. For you, a small, absolutely voluntary donation. All these pouches. Where did I put my wallet? And the the pamphlet that he's giving out uh, and selling that, that sort of tells the truth behind what's going on. Um, the, the cover art is the cover art from this very issue that you're reading this issue of Transformers versus G.I. Joe. And now we're at the pit, this G.I. Joe base. That, and they're having you know, a meeting about this you know, quote-unquote asteroid. But, uh, and the G.I. Joe team knows what it is. They know it's not an asteroid. They know that it is a planet, and it is absolutely on a collision course with Earth. Um, you know, in the previous issue, we sort of, I sort of established the pit as being you know, illuminated red. Um, and so you know, I continue that here. They got the signal from it. And the signal translates into this kind of like pictorial visual thing, kind of like that um, Jodie Foster movie where, you know, they, they get like a transmission from, you know, an alien or whatever. And it's, it, it, it turns out the transmission is, you know, some kind of like, uh, you know, 3D model that tells you how to, you know, how to build a spaceship to get to their planet. They, there's no recognizable, a decipherable language that they can make out 
um, out of this, except for the word Cybertron. And they're not, they're, they're like, okay, we translated that, but what, what the fuck does that mean? Uh, but there are the um, Autobot and Decepticon symbols, and Duke notices that uh, these symbols, we've seen them before, back in the desert on that mission where Snake Eyes... And then, and then Scarlet says, how could I forget? And she, she kind of leaves, and Duke thinks he must have upset her. What? Was it something I said? I know Snake Eyes is a sore subject. Whoever, whatever is transmitting from that hunk of rock wants a meeting. So they, they've sort of, uh, you know, deciphered s some more stuff. Um, I saw three ships. So now this is the first contact. Oh, yeah, that was the Jodie Foster movie, Contact. So this is the first contact with... Um, the Cybertronian aliens who wanted to meet, they, and they you know, met at this specific sector, and the three spaceships that are landing. Um, initially, in the initial version uh, that I wrote, which is you know, printed in the back of this book, which I'll maybe show a little bit uh, at the end of this video, it was supposed to take place on Saturn, and it was supposed to be like the spaceship Nemesis was going to be the one that lands. But uh, you know, through the rewriting and, and, and whatnot, I came up with this idea to kind of, you know, introduce some more transformers, some more recognizable names. So um, instead of one giant ship, it's three sort of smaller ships. And one is the um, Starscream ship, Shockwave ship, and the, um, the Soundwave ship. This was sort of the design I gave the Starscream's, you know, spaceship version. And then I always felt like Shockwave's gun mode, if you turned it upside down, would be like a pretty cool looking starship. So I just kind of went with that for this comic that, that, you know, Shockwave turns into a starship and, and you're basically just turning the, his gun form upside down. And then I came up with sort of like an, a, you know, like a spaceship version of Soundwave's boombox mode, uh, which they've since made a toy out of. Hasbro's made a toy of that. And so they're landing and they, they you know, drew these sort of Autobot and Decepticon symbols um, on the landing pad to kind of like welcome them and whatever. And, and they assume everything's going to be peaceful, but, but, you know, some of the people are not so convinced. And this is uh, General Iron Butt Austin, Destro's opposite, which is kind of a funny idea that, that um, um, you know, boorish character that, uh, that, you know, was in the comics. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, he was kind of, that was, you know, what, this is kind of what General Flag looks like in, in the uh, G.I. Joe cartoon. So they get out of the ship and they figure this guy's gonna do the talking because he looks humanoid and he's and like, oh look, he brought his pets and he's got this um, you know, laser beak perched on his arm. Rumble, he's got uh, laser, th these are the cassettes, you know, so it makes sense that the cassette transformers are flying inside of Soundwave. They were always associated together in the cartoon. And so, you know, he's got, uh, laser beak riding, you know, on, on his arm, like a falconer and then Ravage is walking. But I, I, you know, from pretty early on, I like this idea of Ravage, this, this cat being this, uh, you know, predatory, uh, cat being the spokesperson for, for the, the Decepticons on this mission. And General Hawk goes to meet them and they start talking to each other. And on behalf of the United States of America, I greet you in peace, friendship, and partnership. Excellent, you offer us peace. And on behalf of Megatron, we accept. Megatron, we've been calling your world Cybertron. I wish he would have let us stay by his side. Megatron is not a world, Megatron is our king. And now we're sort of seeing it all through, you know, the, this scope. And the scope is a uh, sniper scope. And um, Snake Eyes is in that hang glider. I, I had the hang glider toy when I was a kid, it looked super cool on the commercial. You'd throw it on the commercial. The kids would throw it and it would fly forever like magic. Um, in real life, you'd throw it and it would kind of fall to the ground immediately. It cracked the helmet of the uh, G.I. Joe. I think it was Grunt who, who came with uh, the one I got and, and his helmet cracked the first day I got him and when, when he hit the ground. My mastery of your language is not quite perfect. There is peace. But there is another word, a better word, surrender. You offer us surrender. Surrender? No, I said peace, and I meant peace. G.I. Joe doesn't know the meaning of the word surrender. We have Ace flying in his, his uh, plane, and we got Duke flying around in, in uh, this little vehicle, which I had when I was a kid. I had this, and I had Duke, and I'd have him flying around in there all the time. Was, this was fun. 
that was practice for, you know, when I'd eventually do this. And, and um, Starscream has turned into a, a version of Ace's plane, which he had done in issue zero as well. So it's kind of like the, it's become this comfortable form for him. And the murp, 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 that's, that's the sound effect of, of the Transformers transforming. Murp, murp, murp. Snake Eyes is aiming. And then blam, blam, General Hawk is shot during this meeting. His you know, backup team, Flash, Laser Soldier, uh, and Lady J, Vamp Driver, they pull up in their Jeep to get him out of there. They don't know what's going on, but it's bad. They, they you know, crash into uh, Ravage and, and Rumble. And then from this panel to this, Soundwave transforms. Uh, they're, you know, uh, General Hawk gets in the car, and, and he says, Initiate Protocol Colton Bolt. Colton, countdown to Colton Bolt. All Joes regroup. And so we have a countdown from 20. So there's 20 panels to the countdown to Colton Bolt. And uh, Soundwave lifts up the Jeep, dumps them into his chest panel where he holds them prisoner. Starscream transforms into robot form. Duke's springing into action, fighting him. All hell breaks loose. Why do you hesitate, brother? Their intent is clear. They defy the will of Megatron. For that, they must be destroyed. I had hoped that Ravage's powers of persuasion would spare us all of this. So they, they sent Ravage to do the speaking for him because uh, Ravage is you know, very eloquent among, uh, among Decepticons. Like, it, it's just kind of a cool idea, this, this you know, having a conversation with this robot cat. Uh, you know, the Joes are all, you know, springing into action. And General Flag has this golden uh, trike that he rides around on, uh, outfitted with this big rifle. And, and it's, it's made from the pieces of Bumblebee that were salvaged um, at, the, at the wreckage site from issue zero. It starts out as kind of just like this sort of, you know, background element that I don't directly reference, but you could probably, you know, from some of the design elements, probably piece that together. But it gets, it, it comes more and more to the foreground as, as the series goes on. And so here's Hawk, Lady J, and, um, and Flash uh, trapped inside of Soundwave's chest, and Flash is sort of cutting out like a circle in the glass to get them out. Ours is but to do and die. It's all part of the plan, right, General? And we have all this action and excitement going on. And I started having this idea of having, you know, sort of, you know, verbiage going on in, in a, in a uh, word balloon and then have, you know, things going on in the foreground to kind of drown it out as though, as though the, the gunshots were sort of drowning out what Flash was saying. And you'll see that throughout the series, too. Uh, somebody asked me at, 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 an, at a convention if, if this was like an accident. But uh, this, this kind of thing doesn't happen by accident. This only, you know, this only happens uh, by design. And the plan that Lady J's referring to, we flash back to the plan. And they're talking about the plan and that the, the whole idea was to corral these, uh, set up this meeting, but have a backup ready to go that if things go to shit, this meeting site is going to turn into a trap for these aliens. And they're going to have the Colton bolt, this orbital laser, you know, ready to go and zap incinerate the aliens and and so we get the story of joe colton and joe colton was from the larry hama comics and um he was sort of he looked kind of like sean connery or something he was kind of like he was supposed to be you know the first gi joe he was supposed to be the gi joe from the 50s the sort of like action battle arm grip guy the the titular gi joe who who we never see and he, and he shows up i don't know in like issue 50 or something like around you know pretty far into the series he's no longer active in the field now he's um, developing, you know, like sort of, you know, orbital lasers and weapons. So that was kind of where I got the little bit of this that like, okay, this is Joe Colton's orbital laser and I'll call it the Colton bolt. Uh, and this is my drawing of Joe Colton. And, you know, he didn't really look anything like that in the comic, but my thought was that Joe Colton, the original GI Joe would be almost like God in this universe. He's, you know, the closest thing to God. He's sort of uh, revered by the GI Joe team. And, and I sort of drew him uh, the way, you know, Jack Kirby would draw Moses or, or draw God and, you know, uh, give him ample Kirby crackle whenever Kirby would do his sort of uh, like religious drawings. And so they're talking about the plan and that, you know, they're going to need a guy to go in there to talk to them and, and that this guy would probably most likely die in, you know, if things do go to shit and, and uh, Hawk volunteers for the job. I think I mentioned like back here, 
um, you know, Iron Butt Austin and General Flag, they're saying, I'm talking about, they're talking about General Hawk as if he's dead. Scratch one more G.I. Joe HQ off the board. He'll be remembered forever. He was the first to fall in Space War One. Hawk died a hero's death. And then General Flag says, some guys have all the luck. That's the kind of death General Flag wants to get. And that's, that's the kind of death I uh, continually deny him throughout the series. Uh, General Flag keeps getting into situations where um, he really should die. And, and um, I kept sparing him because, because like, that's what he, he wants to die in battle. I sort of had this idea of referring to this, this whole Transformers versus G.I. Joe war as Space War One. Flint says, so I guess the next question is, Who's the poor soul that's going to be the cheese in your cosmic mousetrap? You know, another toy or game reference. And, and I think Hasbro, I don't, I don't know that they were the original creators, but they, they you know, I, I think now they are the, you know, publishers of the mousetrap uh, game. And if they ever want to do a mousetrap comic, I've got ideas. You're looking at them. I wouldn't have any of my men and women do anything I wouldn't do myself. Back to the countdown. And now back to the countdown. Eight. Seven. Here's the panel border right there. The, um, you know, I, I had this idea of like the, the full sound wave pose with a little panel border down there. Uh, so you can draw these guys twice, you know, and they're jumping through the hole that, that they cut out of Soundwave's chest. They jump down, you know, land on, on rabbit, uh, uh, land on laser beak to sort of break their fall. If you want to get out of the gates of hell, you have to pass the devil's cat. Colton Bolt is imminent. We don't have time for this. I offered you peace, and you ran me over with your car. That's uh, probably the, one, of the, one of the most quoted lines from this series. All your friends have left you. We've taken your boomsticks. Are you ready to surrender? General Hawk cuts right into Ravage's head with his tomahawk. And I, I don't know that I mentioned this in the previous episode, but uh, General Hawk's tomahawk is modeled after the action team logo that G.I. Joe had during the 70s. You know, I kind of thought, like, wouldn't it be cool if somebody had that symbol and, and wielded it as a weapon? And General Hawk is surprised that his that his very dull war hammer made such a deep slice into this, you know, metal uh, alien. And, uh, you know, what he doesn't know is that his war hammer, his, his tomahawk is actually a, a Cybertronian war hammer that was made... Uh, and given to human allies to fight Decepticons in, in the ancient world. And so even though it's just sort of like a dull uh, hammer when used on anything else, if you use it on a Decepticon, it's going to slice right through them like butter. Uh, Duke is coming in for the rescue. They, they grab onto the, the you know, legs of his craft, and they're holding on to, um, to General Hawk as Snake Eyes is flying right at them guns blazing. And you're not sure what Snake Eyes is up to. It seems like he's shooting at them. It seems like he shot General Hawk, but in future issues, we'll find out there's more to the story than that. Two, one, zero. And so Snake Eyes drops uh, his belt of grenades uh, that he has in the toy. Uh, he drops them onto Starscream's head. They explode and, and you know, break away a big chunk of Starscream's face. The Revenge of Snake Eyes, a face for a face. Snake Eyes lost his face in uh, issue zero, and it was, you know, partly the fault of Starscream, who he, you know, he threw a grenade at Starscream's face, and Star Starscream swatted it back at him in issue zero, and uh, now he gets to deliver a whole belt full of grenades right, right, to, the, right to the face, and, you know, takes away a big chunk of, of Starscream face. Starscream, a very vain Decepticon. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. And now that we've had the countdown to zero, it's time for the Colton Bolt. Colton Bolt, enjoy the fireworks, courtesy of a guy named Joe. Soundwave dies. I hate to see him go. I, I, I felt like this series, it needed deaths. It was a war. And it needed, um, there, there had to be casualties. And it had to be people you cared about. And, and Soundwave is a very popular uh, Transformer, you know, he's one of my favorites and, and you know, he, he, he had to bite the dust. And so that meant I wasn't able to use him, you know, for the remainder of the series, even though I did have other plans for him. Uh, I wasn't able to use him uh, until, you know, some stuff happens later on, but that became the way this thing worked. And it, and it also, like one of the, one of the, the North stars that I was following for this series, one of the things I, that, that I was 
kind of keeping in mind as, as sort of like a, an inspiration was um, Jack Kirby's New Gods. And Jack Kirby's New Gods was like that. He'd introduce some real crazy character and then that character would get killed because that, that comic was a war too. It was this sort of, you know, war of superheroes. General Hawk is in the foreground in this sort of, you know, crucified pose as they're carrying him away. Uh, you know, we're not sure if he's alive or dead. Lin Chi said it best, if you meet Space Buddha, kill Space Buddha. Another, uh, you know, quoted line from this series. And he's got the um, mushroom cloud reflected in his sunglasses. I really like this sequence, these two panels and, and the next page. I like these moments of sort of pure, you know, just like silence, you know, this, the silent issue of G.I. Joe and you got snake, there's snake eyes there. You just kind of let, let the comic breathe, let it be what it's going to be. And, and there's, you know, a couple different things going on. This thing's coming from the background to the foreground, this, you know, giant ship, um, Snake Eyes is sort of coming around in his thing and going this way, and they're getting eaten up by this ship as they as they escape the uh, the mushroom cloud, and are given uh, two travelers alone in a hostile world take sanctuary within the coils of Cobra, and there's uh, there's Serpentris. Everybody comes back and look. General Hawk's okay, and um, General Flag's talking on his his little smartphone, his uh, interstellar smartphone that allows him to communicate with Scarlet, who is leading the uh, mission to Cybertron. Lawrence, I think it's time to activate Scarlet's away team. Yo, Joe, welcome aboard the USS General Flag. Yeah, that's uh, you know deliberate uh, joke reference to the USS General Flag. Um, welcome aboard the USS General Flag. Yeah, I know what you're gonna say before you even say it. The Area Zero trick only works once. These Cybertronians are going to be back and in bigger numbers. Lawrence, I think it's time to activate Scarlet's away team. Flag to Defiant. Bad news from Earth. We met the enemy, and it is giant killer robots. Your mission of exploration is now an invasion. No offense, General. It was never anything but. You're about to become the first human beings to set foot on an alien world, and that planet is enemy soil. No soil in view, General, but you're right. And here's all the, you know, inside the, the, the Defiant spaceship, starship, they, they have all, you know, all the, this is all the gear they're going to have for their, their um, you know, mission on, on the alien world of Cybertron. Whatever their planet is made of, it's about to have G.I. Joe boot prints all over its face. Cybertron now. So there they are, you know, getting ready to land on planet Cybertron. And the now from Cybertron now, I, um, I took from... Like that font, I, I took it from, uh, it's, it's some, you know, Mike Royer lettering from an issue of New Gods. Uh, Mike Royer is, you know, an amazing inker, you know, one of Kirby's best, if not the best. And, uh, but, but even, even better than his inking is his lettering. His lettering is just amazing and, and incredibly influential and wonderful. And so, so there you have it. Um, next issue is pretty exciting. Um, you know, we actually get, you know, G.I. Joe's on Cybertron, which was, the uh, you know elevator pitch for this series, uh, the idea of of GI Joe's uh, running around on a mission on Cybertron, drawn in a Jack Kirby style. That was the elevator pitch. It ended up becoming uh, something else and 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 something much more than that initial elevator pitch. But that is that is the elevator pitch. The rough draft original version of this story. It's sort of a combination of this story and issue zero. It's like there's there's some stuff going on and then a time jump and then the rest of the issue. Um, but we ended up sort of splitting those stories up into the issue zero and issue one and, and of course, expanding, changing, revising them. So this is the original one, the original script, um, the original, like, I, and this was part of my process. I would make rough draft versions of the, uh, of the comics as part of the writing process. And, um, and I do them in the style that I did Satan Soldier, which was the comic I had been working on previous to this, and and it was sort of a it was a creative uh, breakthrough for me, and and so I thought, you know what, this is how I'll do comics going forward. I'll make sort of these quick Satan Soldier versions of them, and then do the finished version, and it'll sort of help me, you know, conceptualize and clarify and things. So, eyes, specialty samurai sword, Sergeant Hauser, codename Duke, 
Colonel Hawk, Leader, Specialty, Tomahawk, Scarlet, Specialty, Crossbow, Roadblock, Specialty, Helicopter Gun. You never know which cave is going to be the one with Bin Laden in it. Which that was the idea. It was sort of like this initial mission would be sort of um, a period piece uh, taking place in the early 2000s, and then we'd flash forward to the present. But since, uh, you know, like a, a monthly comic book should exist within the eternal present, we sort of dropped that conceit when we made Issue Zero, and it's like, Issue Zero takes place now. And then when Issue 1 came out, Issue 1 takes place now. I, I, I feel that, you know, that, that's kind of how, um, you know, superhero comics should work, which, again, I, I consider G.I. Joe a superhero comic. And I, I especially consider uh, G. I. Joe, uh, Transformers versus G.I. Joe a superhero comic. And Transformers is a superhero comic, too. Uh, so, you know, take that. Instead, we found a Cobra chemical weapons lab. Thank goodness you are here. Oh, the things they made me do. My eye, my arm. And then, you, and then um, Major Blood says, like, you something. I, th I think he says, like, you motherfuckers or something. Because, again, um, part of the Satan soldier thing is, like, you don't hold back. You don't self-censor. So I, I, would, I made these comics, uh, these, you know, Satan soldier versions, you know, as you know, without, without any thought of like, oh, you know, uh, you know, can I do that or not do that? They, you know, they, they weren't meant for, um, you know, they, they were sort of, you know, for my eyes only, but, uh, you know, this, you know, comics back matter, I, you know, back matter has been a big part of my life and my career. And, and here we go, this, this, uh, sort of, um, this outlaw comic that, that I made as, as part of my process for making a, a legitimate, um, licensed comic, is now in print, you know, by, by, by that same company. Dr. Venom, pure evil, major blood, terrorist poet. Dr. Venom and his creeper bombs are now property of the United States government. Things got weird. Who knew the enemy had drones this advanced? And then uh, there's, there's Bumblebee speaking in, you know, his uh, Cybertronian language. Ignored my training, ignored my gut. My trigger finger took over. No, Duke, don't. When I woke up, th thought for sure it was all a dream. If only eyes got you out of there. So he's, he's not snake eyes yet. He's just eyes. He becomes snake eyes later. A better man paid the price for my stupidity. Colonel, you're telling me there's not one trace left of that gold-plated walking, talking enemy drone that can turn into a fucking Volkswagen? Uh, the fucking part got, you know, censored out of there. You're asking questions way above your pay grade, Duke. Hawk refused to take my resignation. I ended up making a career for following him into situations as he rose up the ranks. I followed General Hawk to Saturn's moon Titan, where he started an interplanetary war that I was going to have to finish. This is a fucking good comic. They should, they should publish this as its own thing. And then here's the... Um, this would be like the headline on the newspaper. Not alone, life on Cybertron. Dancing in the streets following live space telescope video showing moving shapes on the distant world. Scientists are calling this absolute confirmation and incontrovertible proof of, and then here's the president giving a speech. But we need to hope for the best while preparing for the worst. We must assume the inhabitants of the world are hostile. Not because we have any evidence of hostile intention, but be because the price of being unprepared for such a possibility would mean nothing less than the extinction of the human race. Are my ears clogged, or did the fucking president of the motherfucking United States just give a worldwide address about the extinction of the human race? Spirit Iron Knife was the first to decipher the message, not too different from his grandfather's language. The Cybertronians are trying to talk to us the best way they know how. They called for a first meeting someplace not too inconvenient for us, not too inconvenient for them, at the Global Space Alliance's new colony on Titan. Who knew Dr. Venom's creeper bombs could be repurposed into terraforming green bombs, making long-term habitable space colonies a reality? So that's what we're on Titan. Thanks to Dr. Venom's creeper bombs, and the vegetation that they that they spew, you can now live sustainably on one of Titan's moons. And so, you know, GI Joe team has been part of you know, sort of an interplanetary colonization. And Spirit Iron Knife, codename Gung Ho, Lady J, specialty Javelin. You know, some kind of curse is is uh, you know 
erased out of here, but it's after all the bullshit I've seen, it's, e you know, after all the fucking shit I've seen, it's easy to be jaded, but that Cybertronian ship is a thing of beauty, uh, which I agree. I, I always like that, that uh, nemesis ship design. Keep it together, Duke. Try to live up to the name on your belt buckle, Mutt and Junkyard. And you're our diplomat. Maybe you should be in charge of security instead of me. A ragtag bunch. Like us Joes. They brought their pets, too. Easy, boy. Junkyard wants to say hello to that space kitty. That's an awfully big ship for just those three. Good point, Jay. Spirit, try scanning that ship every possible frequency. I don't want any surprises for our man Hawk. One step ahead of you, Duke. Should have something soon. Greetings from Megatron. Megatron, we've been calling your world Cybertron. Didn't realize how close we got to your planet's real name. Megatron is not a world. Megatron is our king. So it's a monarchy. We of Earth have no king. I was entrusted with the honor and responsibility to speak on our world's behalf, welcoming you in peace and friendship. Excellent, you offer us peace. And on behalf of Megatron, we accept. No signs of life coming up. Those aren't space suits. See, and that was part of the like initial concept is that when they'd first meet there'd be kind of a similarity. There'd be the G.I. Joes in space suits, which would make them look kind of robotic. And then you'd have uh, the, the Transformers, uh, which it would assume, which the G.I. Joes would assume are, are, you know, just, you know, organic aliens in space suits. You know, they, they don't realize at first that they're, they're actually just robots through and through. And the idea of having Soundwave's cassettes uh, be the, the, the point men was just, it, it, you know, kind of got, got them in, in like a similar scale. You know, they're, 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 they're still much larger than, than a human being, but they're, they're closer in scale than um, the, the other Transformers. So, you know, they, they were able to have a little more of a conversation. Those aren't spacesuits. My mastery of your language is not quite perfect. There is peace, but there is another word, a more precise word, a better word, surrender. You offer us surrender. Surrender? No, peace is the word. <laughs> the stacked... Um, panels of, of sort of, you know, wide panels uh, is, you know, a really nice storytelling device. I didn't end up using that exclusively in, in the comic, but I, I um, last bunch of projects that I've done in, in the past um, two or three years, I've, I've used that exclusively. We came here in peace, friendship, and partnership. The more I use your language, the better it feels in my vocal circuits. Surrender is the word. Yes, that feels right. We are here to discuss the terms of your surrender to Megatron. Surrender? Surrender? No warm bodies, but the ship is crawling with ordnance and cybernetic delivery systems. Hell no! If I knew surrender is what you wanted, I would have filled these rockets with plutonium instead of diplomats. Junkyard is growling. Arr. Cybernetic delivery systems? Killer robots, gung ho. Killer robots, and this is Duke's uh, little his little Luke Skywalker goggles that the toy came with, um, and it's Duco Vision. Killer robots, yo Joe. Evacuate the civilians. Retreat. I did some stuff beyond this, but that's that's about as far as this got. Like there, there's some like sort of rougher, even rougher versions. And this one, you know, I never got to the point of coloring. But by this point, the um the sort of you know rough um. Ash can Satan soldier version had sort of done served its purpose where it's like, okay, I, I was starting to get like a pretty clear picture of how this story, how the scene would unfold. Um, and then, you know, as I would, you know, write and rewrite, um, it would, uh, you know, get closer to what, what, you know, ultimately becomes the, the finished version. Well, I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, the Epic Life of the King of Comics, Fantastic Four Grand Design and Transformers versus GI Joe. See you next time.